Meccano, part number P203, town end ring. With a radial engine from the 1933 aeroplane constructor set. Hi folks and welcome back. I hope you're all well and feeling rather dapper in the warm weather that should be here by the time this is aired. It's the middle of January 2023 when I'm writing it and the thoughts of warm air of summer seem a long way away. Flight seems to be broken into two different worlds pre-World War II and post-World War II. The conflict saw the advances in technology and engineering that would propel us to where we are today. And without those military advances, would we be where we are now in our civilian world? But there's something about that pre-war period, albeit only 20 years, that seems to hold our imaginations. That short, one generational time, that seems to be perfect, but yet I'm quite sure it wasn't. I'm quite sure that for the rich it was great, but for the poor it was miserable. My parents remember it with great fondness. My father, born in 1927, and my mother in 1932. Both remember times of perfect summers and winters that you only see on Christmas cards and great freedom. A future that was based on the sciences that if you really applied oneself you could rise above the meaningless shackles of boring humdrum life regardless of your class and society. For my father he found chemistry, maths and chess in which to lose himself. For my mother, it was botany, biology, art and literature. I gather they were both a challenge to their teachers for knowledge, especially my mother, who at the time... I gather they were both able to challenge their teachers for knowledge, especially my mother, who at the time, still being under ten, listened to friends and her parents argue science and culture. It was here that she was introduced to art, mixing with Russian artists who had escaped the purges of Soviet Russia. My, my father grew up with indulging uncles who helped him learn chemistry by buying him sets that now you're not allowed to purchase. His grandfather's silver-plated pocket watch disappeared in a bath of acid one day after it had been taken to bits and being unable to put it back together, the evidence needed to be hidden. And as children, even though he wanted us to learn chemistry, we were never allowed a chemistry set because of his past misdeeds. After all, in his logic, if he had done it, then we would also. And for me, growing up in the 1970s, I think I caught the last swan song of that perfect time the last dying romance of that period. But did I? As I compare my childhood to that of now, I don't think I'd change much. But even though storm clouds gather again in Europe, I never knew the fear that my parents did in the late 1930s. There can be few things as truly terrifying as that of seeing what is coming and knowing that there is nothing you can do to stop it. The RAF of the early 1930s must have felt pretty safe, defended by the North Sea and the English Channel, with France, the only serious military threat in Europe, as our allies. At last, we had a good buffer zone. At the time, no long-range bomber could reach us, and the Royal Navy was still the strongest navy on sea. Britain was safe. But by the middle of the decade, the warning clouds were already there. The outbreak of the Spanish Civil War in 1936 was one of the last warnings needed. No longer could the RAF meet the demand that would be placed on it. A new breed of aircraft was coming. Faster, sleeker, more heavily armed and armoured. The humble biplane had met its day. As aircraft like the Russian I-16 
and the German ME-109 fought for control of the Spanish skies. Also, long-range bombers were appearing, with aircraft like the HE-111 and the FW-200 Condor meant that Britain could be reached by an enemy force. As early as 1930, the Air Ministry put forward a specification of the next generation of fighter aircraft, with Hawker putting forward the PV-3. They lost the competition to the Gloucester Gladiator, probably the best First World War fighter ever invented. The main problem was that of RAF senior staff being prejudiced against the adoption of monoplanes. After all, biplanes had served just fine for the last 20 years. But as I said, the storm clouds were gathering. And by the time the F5.34 specification went out for testing, moods had changed. Hawker put forward a new aircraft, built to specifications requested by fighter pilots, not someone who sat in an office and had never flown in combat. Ominent was transferred to the wings. Undercarriage was to be retractable. Range to be improved. The list went on. Two aircraft came forward at this time. One to be the backbone of the RAF, easy to fix, and a heavy hitter, capable of carrying heavy ordnance. The other, by far, to be the RAF pinup, but an aircraft the likes of which had never been seen before. The Hawker Hurricane and the Supermarine Spitfire. But this build is not about those aircraft. It's about the aircraft that held the front line for only six years against the storm clouds that, that would leave it burning on the ground if the challenge had come. It is immortalised on the silver screen in H.G. Wells' movie, The Shape of Things to Come. The Hawker Fury. It is easy to look at what was coming and almost laugh at the RAF in the 1930s, seemingly trapped in a different decade and unable to move forward with new designs. But to be honest, the new designs were not up to the job. The Vickers Jockey, a sleek, late 1920s low-wing monoplane was no match against the Hawker Fury, which was the first fighter plane in British service to be capable of reaching speeds over 200 miles per hour. And alongside its slower cousin, the Bristol Bulldog, which had been introduced two years earlier, they seemed well-armed and capable machines, both carrying two .303 Mark IV Vickers machine guns. What both the Fury and the Bulldog did was to buy us time. In many ways, what was needed more than machines was trained pilots. This is something that the Russian Air Force is finding in the Ukraine now. They have the machines, but they don't have the pilots, due to both cost-cutting of budgets and relocation of said budget, normally into somebody else's pocket. We needed the time to get both the Hurricane and Spitfire to squadron strength, crews trained, supply chains set up, factories ready to build the numbers that would be needed, and to invest the capital for radar. Without that, our great nation would have fallen in 1940, unable to defend itself. The Fury never fought for the RAF in World War II, but elsewhere they did fight. The Royal Yugoslavian Air Force operated around 25 in 1941 and in early April Operation 25 began, the German invasion of Yugoslavia. On the 6th of April a squadron of Yugoslavian Furies encountered a force of ME BF-109Es and BF-110s. In the ensuing battle ten of the Furies were shot down with another eight aircraft destroyed on the ground. Eight of the pilots were killed in a battle against a technically superior foe with better equipment. The German forces lost a total of eight aircraft, all but one seemingly through non-combat losses. The one loss 
was when a Fury pilot decided that his best option was to ram a BF-109, taking both the enemy and himself out at the same time. On the fateful day, watching from the ground was the commanding officer for the squadron 36LG, Major Franjo Dazal. The Major would go on to serve the Croatian Air Force Legion operating on the Eastern Front in Russia. In 1945 he returned to Croatia and at the end of the war was captured in Austria by the Allies. He was repatriated to Yugoslavia, now under communist control, and was promptly arrested by the government and sentenced to death. He was executed in September of 1945. But the Hawker Fury saw action with another air force, the Royal Iranian Air Force, till around 1949. In 1941, Iran declared its neutrality in the Second World War to be promptly invaded by both the Allies and the Soviet Union in an attempt to stop Germany getting the oil reserves. The Iranian Air Force found itself fighting for its very life against the very aircraft which the Fury had been holding the line for in the RAF until replaced, the Hawker Hurricane, along with the P-40 Tomahawk. The Furies were completely outmatched and outgunned. 20mm cannon and 50 cal machine guns made short work of the pre-war 303 armed biplanes. Most were either shot down as they tried to defend their country or were destroyed on the ground as Iranian air force bases fell to either the British or the Russians. Some aircraft were hidden in the hope that post-war the Air Force would be able to re-equip itself with at least some type of aircraft to try and defend the country. I wonder what those last Hawker Furies felt like when in 1949 they would watch their replacements drop out of the sky and taxi to a halt, as ex-RAF wartime Hawker Hurricanes, in some cases maybe the same aircraft that had defeated the outclassed Iranian Furies some eight years earlier were supplied to the country to re-equip the Air Force. The same would also happen in Yugoslavia as unwanted airframes that still had some life left in them would be supplied to countries that in a few years would become enemies.